Good evening. It's good to see everyone. It's always an, uh, a pleasure when we can uh, come and you know, partake in you know, some of the, the pillars of our faith, such as the preaching and you know, the singing and uh, the hot dogs. So it's always good when we can get together as a church family and see each other. So I think they may have told you that we're uh, looking at Acts chapter 17 tonight. So I'd like to start off as the first sermon by getting you to turn to Romans chapter 1. Right. Romans chapter 1. I ask you the question tonight. Is there still an altar to the unknown God? Mm. Right. Okay, as a follow-up, where is the altar to the unknown God? How did it start? Who worships at it? Can we see it today? Well, if you found Romans chapter 1, I want to read uh, two verses, and we're going to see three truths tonight about the altar of the unknown God. So in Romans chapter 1, we are going to look at... Verse 19. So you follow along as I read out loud. We see, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All right, let's bow and pray before we get into this. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that we are about to study. I pray that you will uh, speak to our hearts. I pray that you will uh, give, give me wisdom as I speak. I pray that uh, we'll, we'll be closer to you uh, through your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Three truths about the altar to the unknown. First, let's get right down to business. Let's see the location of the altar. The location of the altar is seen in verse 19. And I promise, if you're a little lost, we are going to circle back to Acts chapter 17, so just hold on. So the location of the altar. In verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Paul is speaking about the Jew and the Gentile. He's talking about the people that don't know God. He's talking about every single person. <clears throat> I believe in this chapter, he is referencing the very altar to the unknown God that the Athenians found themselves. And Paul tells us that this altar is located in the heart of every single person. Because he says, whatever there is that can be known about God, it's manifest in the hearts of every person. <coughs> Inside of your heart, Christian, is a place that tells you that there is a God. Inside of your heart, unbeliever, there is a place that tells you there is a God. It doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity, your nationality, your background, or anything about you. We all have a something inside of us telling us there is a God. And I believe that's why the psalmist so eloquently wrote, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And that's not because the, the, the atheist studied it out and came to the conclusion that there is no God. That's not why he writes that. Right. It's not that evidence pointed him in the other way. It's because inside of his heart, he sees there is a God and he chooses to ignore exactly what he sees. It would just be just as foolish as me saying, you see this altar right here, Pastor Brian? Mm -hmm. I don't see it. It's not here. I don't know what altar you're talking about. I don't see it right there. It would be just as, it's just as foolish to say, I know what's inside my heart, but I choose to ignore it, and there is no God. <clears throat> the location of the altar is inside the heart of every person, and it's put there by God himself. Um, in verse 19, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God God hath showed it to them. It's not anything natural that shows us there is a God. It's not 
our observations that tell us there is a God. In fact, it is God himself that puts this knowledge in our heart. The location of the altar of the unknown is in our hearts. Let's look at the beginning of the altar. How did it start? Where did it come from? Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now the key phrase is, from the creation of the world. From doesn't mean the source. It's not like saying, I went and got a bag of Doritos from Walmart. In this case, it's a little closer to the word since. That's right. It means that since the creation of the world. Good. Going back to our Doritos analogy, I've had a bag of Doritos since last Saturday. So in this case, we see that the invisible things of God are revealed in our hearts since the creation of the world, since the very beginning. So it doesn't matter what time period you've lived in, whether past, present, or future, God has revealed himself to every person of all time, saying that there is a God. When there were people that walked to the earth with Abraham, and of those people that we know of, only one of them received a vision from God, Abraham. But all of the rest of the people, they still had a revelation from God. A revelation in their heart saying there is a God. So the altar to the unknown is in our hearts. It began in eternity past with creation. But let's see our third truth about the altar of the unknown. And that's going to be the message of the altar. <clears throat> the message of the altar, let's just read all of verse 20 and we'll, we'll uh, dwell on, on the relevant parts. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And let me just stop there and say that from the creation of the world is talking about the time, but this phrase is telling us how we know. It's from the uh, being understood by the things that are made. We look around us and we see that there is a God. We'll come back to that thought in just a second. Even, and this is what we see, this is the message of the altar, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. There are three messages from the altar to the unknown. Eternal, power, and Godhead. First, eternal. We see that God is eternal by seeing what he has made. And it, very simply, something must be eternal. There must be a beginning. There must be a beginner. If we choose to look around us and see the world and say that the world is eternal, that makes no logical, nor may I say scientific sense. Right. But if we look around us and we say there has to be something that began all of this, all that we can come to the conclusion of is there is a God that began all of this. And to do this, this God must be eternal. So by looking at the creation, we see that God is eternal. We also see that God is powerful. We look at the complexity of the human body. We look at the laws of science. We look at the, the intricacies of, of the atom. We look at the expanse of the universe. We look at all of the creation that God made, so complex that we can't even begin to understand all of it. And we know that our God, whoever it is that created all this, must be powerful. Amen. Finally, his Godhead, or another term, his deity. Right. Everything that there is to know about God, everything that he is, mm -hmm. we can look at our cre at creation and know there is a person that started all this. There's a person that is powerful, a being that wants to know us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the message of the unknown's altar is his eternal, his power, and his Godhead. Amen. Now before we get back to Acts chapter 17, let me point out that there are a couple of things that this altar does not tell us. A couple of very important pieces of information. It doesn't quite tell us about Jesus. It doesn't tell us the good news, the gospel. 
It doesn't tell us that God made a way that we can escape condemnation and be with Him forever. All that this tells us is that there is a God that we should seek and we should try to follow. And because of this, they are without excuse. That is the message of the unknown's altar. So let's go back to Acts chapter 17. In case you doubted me that this is the altar, I think once we read through Acts chapter 17, it'll, it'll make sense. So Acts chapter 17, in verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So Paul says, you worship someone, the unknown God, that you haven't figured out who he is, but I'm getting ready to show you who he is. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Paul says, the unknown God that you're worshiping is the one that made everything. That's exactly what we saw in Romans chapter 1. The creator of the world... Verse 25, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So God has made everything. He's made every person. Now we're going to see what he expects of us, which mirrors exactly what we saw in Romans chapter 1. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel, out, feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have have our being, as certain also of your poets have said, for we are his offspring. So we are created in the image of God, even the Athenians understood this, that we are made in the likeness of God, and for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's desire. So, this even uses the same word. It almost makes it too easy for us. We know that we're created in the image of God, and if that is true, then we can look at each other, look at creation, and know that God is a being, a personal being, that wants a relationship with us, and we see his Godhead and his deity in all that there is around us. So, is there an altar to the unknown God today? I think the answer is a resounding yes. It's when we look around us and we see nature. We see everything that God has created. So, there is much about God that we can only get from His revealed Word to us. But sometimes I think it would be good for us to, to put, put our Bible down for a second and take a look around us. Right. And come to the same realization that the psalmist said. That the heavens declare the handiwork of God. And to find this altar to the unknown. See his magnificence and his wonder revealed in all the world around us. And bow down at his altar and worship. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and thank you for your goodness. Pray that you'll help us to worship you and to honor you and to see you all around us in everything. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, take a good look at what you're looking at, fellas. This is what you get when you get my age. Old and wore out. Before they start to clock on me, I'll tell you one thing. I was thanking the Lord the other day with all my heart. I am 67 years old. I've been in ministry almost 45 years. And God still uses me. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. You need season like you need uh, coffee. Now, some of you are not coffee drinkers. That means you're out of the will of God. <laughs> you know, talk to me after the service. But I'm honored. I, I was helping out here last year. Uh, I was telling some of the young ladies that sang a while ago. Uh, we're going to be with Daniel Boone a couple of weeks. We're going to be down in Eden, North Carolina, where Pastor Brian did some revivals. Uh, Mike Conn took that church, and I'm going down there 
do their homecoming in the end of September, and God just keeps opening. When I first stepped away from pastoring to do what I'm doing, I wondered, Lord, is anybody going to call me? Because I'm not on TV, and I'm not swaggered, thank God, and some of the others. But uh, it's amazing how the Lord opens the door. Somebody asked me the other day, uh, are you preaching as much as I want? And I thank the Lord. See, about this, I can come in, preach, stir trouble, and I'm gone. You know, you guys, <laughs> you guys deal with it when you get home. But Brother Joel read, and I was studying this, and I believe that in presenting the Lamb of God, there's got to be some common ground. Now, most of you today will say that you are saved. And I would say to that, amen. But all of you are not saved, and I'm not a fool to believe that you are. Uh, we don't present the Lord today. I told Pastor Brian this morning, I say to Dave and to Brother Matt, I don't envy what you're about to face because the world's not going to get any better. And I don't care what they tell you, the golden age is not going to be coming in until Jesus sits on the phone in Jerusalem. Amen. And so I think that uh, uh, if they ever needed prayer, these young people today need prayer. And we get so impatient with them. Now, when I was a little boy, everything was okay. I mean, my mom called me her little man when she liked me. She called me a little hellion when she didn't. And I got the last name more than the first name, but uh, I was saved in 1962. That was before most of you were born. And I started teaching Sunday school at 15. I gave my testimony before. I was called to preach at 15 and proceeded to run from the Lord. Ran all the way to Vietnam. And I found that when I got to Vietnam, God was still pursuing me. I'm glad he's the God of second chance. Yes, thank you, Lord. But a lot of you today, if Christ is not truly your Savior, and you need to examine because we're not here to entertain you tonight. Right. You had some good food, played some basketball, whatever you did, and then you come into the service. But he will remain the unknown God as long as he's not here. Right. He will remain the unknown God as long as he's not in your heart. John says in chapter 4, and because of my time, you don't have to turn. God asks us if our worship is real. Jesus said that we were to worship him in spirit and in truth. In John chapter 4 and verse uh, 22, you worship, you know not what. What are you worshiping tonight? He's talking about attitude. If we came here tonight expecting to be entertained, we have the wrong attitude. If we came and we're making notes or we're sleeping or we're not paying attention, it's the attitude that God is going to hold us accountable for. He's not only going to hold the ones that sang and did the preaching to you tonight, our attitude toward you, but God is going to hold each of us, our attitude that we had on the 13th of August when we came in to the house of God. Now let me kill it right off. These pastors here tonight are not here to compete. We're here to present the same word of God. And I'll bet you one thing. We can ask all of you wish night and you'll say, what? What did he say? I didn't understand a word he was saying. So it's attitude, and that's what the Lamb of God says. He said, the hour comes now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I think that most of you that, that know the Lord Jesus, you give God the glory and you thank God that you still can attend a Bible-believing church. That's not the case in much of Roanoke Valley tonight. One of the things the pastor said a few weeks ago, and I took note of it, I do pay attention uh, once in a while, and I shared it with some other preachers. He said, if you don't have any root, you don't have any fruit. So look at your life tonight. Is there any fruit? If there's no fruit, it's because you're shallow. Your root doesn't run very deep. You come to the house of God. You say a few prayers. You listen to a few songs. You pray that the pastor doesn't go past 12 o'clock. And then you get up and you rush 
It's amazing. Wouldn't it be something if we rushed to God's throne as fast as we rushed to the restaurants on Sunday? That's good. Come on now. We hurry up because we don't know who He is. And for some of you that didn't make it tonight, uh, you know why they didn't come back? This is the young people's service. Let me tell you something. Young people need to see that you believe in them. Amen. I mean, I could have sat home tonight. Now, one of the ladies swallowed ago said I was seasoned, which is another word for being old. <laughs> but good. My mom used to season hams. We used to butcher, and she just didn't put the pepper and the salt on the ham. She rubbed it in and rubbed it in and rubbed it in, put it in a burlap sack, and then hung it down in the cellar so the rats wouldn't get it. And I'm telling you, in the middle of winter, when you sliced it off, I mean, you ain't had bacon until you've had seasoned bacon done by a butcher like my mother. It was something else to behold. But most of us tonight don't know that. Most of us tonight are concerned about one thing. Let's get through to the next day. Oh my goodness, tomorrow's Monday. Get through Friday. Get through until we retire. And then when we retire, we can sit down and do what we, what we please. Um, retirement's not all it's cracked up to be. And I know. I would rather be doing something all the time than doing nothing, nothing of the time. You'll get that when you get home, okay? So genuine and real worship to God starts with attitude. What is my attitude? That I have approached the holy, living God tonight, a clear book with a group of believers. Would God accept my attitude toward Him as far as my worship is concerned tonight? Would He accept that? Or would He say, hey, you just came to kill two hours and eat hot dogs. Mm. It's a fearsome thing to think that we treat God like a hot dog. Mm. Well, and some of us do. We treat him like he's just a special treat every once in a while. Right. Yet if he is the known God in your heart, he is special 24-7. Amen. Let me give you an example. I don't mean to put him on the spot, but I'm going to do it anyway. You ever watch Elizabeth Fitch over here the way she's looking at this young man? She likes him more than a hot dog, I can tell you that. <laughs> and it's nothing wrong with that. If they have found each other, it's what God wants, and they get married. And I told Bob, I said, you better get ready. You might call him be a missionary in Paraguay. You'll see him every nine years. <laughs> Bob said, I don't think so. Well, we got to let him go. My daughter's coming down uh, Labor Day from Michigan. We have not seen her or my three granddaughters in six years. We look forward to seeing them. And we look forward to them leaving. <laughs> <laughs> the unknown God. Who is he in your life tonight? And do you know who he is? Today we as a, a call ourselves a Christian society, but for most of America he's unknown. Most of America does not know who Jesus is. I met a man, I think I told you this some years back in Kroger's in Rocky Mount, and was witnessing to him and he said, well, wait a minute, whoa, wait, stop. He said, I've never heard of this one called Jesus Christ. I've never heard his name mentioned. This is in Rocky Mount, a civilized town, most of the time. <laughs> Didn't know who God was. And we go out as Christians tonight, look at your life. We will go out tonight and we as the children of God, and God forbid some pastors, we will treat God like an unknown God till next week You're right. when we meet Him again. You're right about that. And we say, okay, Lord, here I am, and I'm here to worship you. God's looking at the heart. God's looking at the mind. So He's an unknown God to the unsaved because they don't know Him. He's an unknown God to the believer because somebody else is more important in their life. I've been sharing my faith with a young Christian couple and trying to convince them through the Spirit of God and witnessing to them. You know, if I had to do it over again, I'd do what I've done. I met my wife in 1970. We got married in 71. She found that she had a good thing and she stayed with me. <laughs> but those first few years we were married, he was an unknown God in my life and I taught Sunday school. I taught Sunday school, but he was unknown. 
I wanted everybody to know that I was saved when I was in church, but I didn't want them to know it when I went outside the church because I wanted to party. I wanted to have a good time. I wanted to do as I please. And Jesus Christ has got to be first in your life or not at all. And when we look at our life, is he really first in our life? Is he number one in our life? Psychiatrist asked me, yeah, I go to a nut doctor. I only went while I was trying to get my benefits. I don't have to go back because now they know I'm crazy. <laughs> but he said, Mr. Andrews, well, who's the most important person in your life? Right away, tell me who it is. And I said, Jesus Christ. And he looked at me and he said, are you crazy? <laughs> and I said, why do you ask that question? He said, generally people will say their wife or their husband. I love my wife more than any human being that, that is alive or dead. But I don't love her more than my Savior. Amen, brother. That's good. She cannot do for me what my Savior has already done and is going to continue to do. Mm -hmm. So he told me I was crazy. I said, I want you to write that on the report so the doctors will know and I'll get my benefits. I, I had to admit I was crazy before I'd get benefits. <laughs> Most Christians act the same way. Jesus said in Romans chapter 10, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 3, 36, He that believes not, God's wrath abides on him. In other words, if you're sitting here, whoever you are, and you don't know him, he's not your God in, in, in here, on the seat of emotion, in your soul where he came and suffered and died for you and me. If he's not your Savior, God's wrath right now abides on you. And I'm glad I'm not under the wrath of God. But I'm under the love of God. I'm under the chastening hand of God. And then Paul doesn't leave him alone. People today say that Jesus arose from the grave spiritually. But that's it. Some don't even admit that. You know, without the resurrection, we might as well turn off the lights and go, and we have nothing. Because Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. As Brother Matt just said, He is the deity, He is God, He is man, He is our Lord, He is our Savior. But I urge you tonight to examine your own heart and say, is He really first in my life? We look to our pastor to give us leadership. Most of the time he does. We look to him to give us guidance. We look to him for counseling. All the things that we dump on the preacher. And by the way, if God did not think Pastor Brian Ratliff could carry the load, he never would have gave it to him. We must trust God tonight for those who need to be saved. In closing, I took the pastor's advice. I was listening to him and the various ways that we can witness. You don't have to get down to this young man and get up in his face. You can, but there's other ways. And I sent out some tracks. One to a Catholic friend of mine, my best friend overseas. I hadn't seen him in 47 years, but I sent him a track. He's a Catholic. I sent a track to a multimillionaire in Gladys. We rented from him some years back. Good man, but does not believe that Jesus is God. And then I sent a track to my nephew. My nephew is 42 years old. My nephew grew up in a Christian home, grew up in church, and absolutely looked at his father a few months back and said, Dad, that's not for me. And I sent him a track and I said, Lynn, unless you push your devil out of the way and run to the Savior, you have no hope of eternity. My friend from Michigan was the only one, well, the millionaire called me. The millionaire called me and actually said, thank you. He said, I'm not ready yet, but thank you. And I said, Bob, I want to introduce you to the known God in his name is Jesus Christ. And he's just a, he's a good man. He's a rich man, but he's a lost man. He still has the unknown God here. My nephew don't want anything to do with it. Maybe he's watched other people. Maybe they're watching you tonight. And I see that my time is up. So let me say to you tonight, who is the unknown God to you? When you leave this place and you do your journey this week, will Jesus Christ be first in your life or will he be last? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this type of service where many can stand. Lord, you didn't tell us that we had to do it from 6 to 7 or 11 to 12, but to come with the right attitude to worship you. And I thank you, Lord, that the pastor chose and David chose to ask me to be a part of it. And I thank you, Lord, for just a brief moment of being able to let them know that you're looking at our attitude tonight as Christians. And Lord, if you're not our Lord and Savior, 
you're still the unknown God. And if you're the unknown God, we have no hope of spending eternity with you. Speak to their hearts as we continue. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'd like to draw your attention to the book of Acts, chapter 17, as you're very well familiar with. But I want to draw your attention to really one verse. One verse, and in fact, it's a not a statement this evening, but a question. Look at verse number 18, about halfway through. These philosophers that were there, speaking about the Apostle Paul, asked this question. And it says, what will this babbler say? I want to draw your attention to one verse, uh, excuse me, one word this evening, the word babbler. Would you say babbler with me on three? One, two, three. Babbler. One more time, please. Babbler. Today, I want to just label my thoughts with three words. Babblers for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you that it is alive and forever settled in heaven. And now, Father, I pray that you would give me the unction to function here in the congregation. And God, I pray that you set me aside, cleanse me from sin. Use me, God, this evening to edify the body and evangelize the lost. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. When the first time I ever heard of a missionary. I was at Boonsville Baptist Church. I was just a, uh, probably a teenager or maybe a junior. And it was a missionary from Czech Republic. And if my mind serves me correct, I think that guy came to our house and played some music with my mom and some of the others there. He had his guitar all the way from Czech Republic at my house. First time I was ever exposed to a foreign missionary. And I began to listen to him. And I heard his heart about this area in the world overseas. And I began to think about different seasons of life, like what would God have for me? While I was in Bible college, a junior at Crown College, what I had, my plan, was I was going to, one summer, I was going to go to Israel, I was going to learn Hebrew in a summer, and I was going to go to an area in the world that didn't have a copy of God's Word, and I was going to be a Bible translator. I had my plan set. But as I enrolled in my senior year of Bible college, God said otherwise. Anyways, I say that to say this. That yes, we can talk about some of the great missionaries of the modern era. But one of the greatest missionaries we find in the book of Acts was the Apostle Paul. He went on three missionary journeys. And on this missionary journey, we find he is going to different cities. In Acts chapter 16, he sets out and he goes to the land of Philippi, this city. And there he preaches the gospel. They take him and they throw him in jail. And he's he, him and the Silas are there preaching and praying and, and singing praises to God at the midnight hour. And the earthquake happens, rattles the cage. And the jailer comes in and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He gets out of there. He goes to a land called Thessalonica. He goes to a man named Jason's, uh, Jason's house, in fact. Not this brother Jason, but another brother Jason back in the day. And there, he was there for about 30 days, one month, we believe, tops. And the Jewish people and some of the leaders in that area heard about him, and they ran them out of town. He goes to Berea. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, that the believers in Berea, or these people in Berea, were more noble in Thessalonica, in that they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether the things were so with all readiness of mind. The, the people in Thessalonica heard about that Paul was in, in Berea and they come and they wreak havoc in Berea and run Paul out of town and Paul finds himself at Athens in Greece. And we find that this place was smitten with idolatry. And today these philosophers come to this passage, to this day of the Apostle Paul's here and they, says, they say, what will this babbler say? They heard that he preached that Jesus rose from the dead, and they wanted to hear about it. The Athenians, as you read in the passage, Brother Joel read that these Athenians, they liked to hear all about new stuff and anything they could hear. They were very superstitious. So they wanted to hear what he said, but I want to zoom in on the word babbler. And I just want to talk about this evening uh, three words, babblers for Jesus. This word babbler, it literally means a seed picker. If you could imagine a crow flying in the air, zooming down to pick its prey and take it away, that's what this word babbler means. He, he pulls out a point here and pulls out a, a saying here and he begins to talk. It also goes in a little bit deeper and kind of like a sponger, if you will, or a loafer. Somebody who you go up and squeeze 
sees him in a conversation and, and he just starts rattling and 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 they rattle so much that the rattling sound gets a little annoying. I also began to study the word babbler and I came across this. The, there, there's some type of bird that's, that's similar to the passage here, this meaning. And it gives this idea that the bird that chirps and chirps and chirps and chirps and chirps until you just can't have it anymore. But as I read this passage and have been meditating here, I begin to think about how these people were calling him a babbler to make fun of him and to mock him. And today I just want to share with you, enough people have mocked me and mocked you for our faith. And it's time that we just keep babbling on for Jesus Christ. Today I want to draw your attention here. One of the greatest sermons in the book of Acts. It's interesting. You would think in homiletics, that is how to preach. You would think that in those preaching classes in Bible college and seminary that they would open up the Bible and study the sermons that the apostles preached that are inspired by God. But we didn't really do that. But in this sermon, we find the apostle stands. And notice the context. He's not speaking to Jewish people. So he does not really reference a Old Testament scripture, but he does reference the Old Testament God, I believe Jesus Christ. So today I want to share three thoughts with you from our passage. In verses 24 through 29, I just want to share this thought. Babble about Christ, the Creator. As I read verses 30 through 31, I wrote down secondly, Babel about Christ the Vindicator. That means judge. And then as I read the last couple verses, 32 through 34, I wrote down this, Babel about Christ the Savior. You see, the Apostle Paul may not have been referencing any passage of Scripture, but as you read the text, you find many passages of Scripture coming through the words of inspiration of God in this sermon. Look at verse 24. The Bible says, After he speaks about how you are ignorantly worshipped, Worshipping the unknown God, I am going to declare Him unto you. And today our message is very similar. God wants us to declare the gospel of salvation. And sometimes my zeal does outweigh my knowledge. And my passion may outweigh my presentation. But nonetheless, we are called to declare the good news of Jesus Christ. His death, His burial, and His resurrection. And, but it has to start with the book of Genesis. So look at verse 24. It says, God that made the world, as I read verses 24 through 29, I just wrote down this, babble about Christ the Creator. He is God who created the world. He literally spoke the world into existence. Uh, it wasn't built like we would build a building today. God said it, and it happened, and that settles it, and I'm just crazy enough to believe it. And listen, the, the crazy world that we live in, they can, they can call us babblers all they want to, but I'm going to keep babbling about the God who I believe firmly and passionately and strongly created this world. Verse 24 talks about how He made the world and everything that's in it. It says that, 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 that it goes on to say, seeing He is the Lord of heaven and of earth, He does not dwell in temples made with hands. So here we have a pagan society worshiping false gods in a pagan temple. And God cannot fit in a temple because He is the potentate, almighty, powerful God. His throne is not in a Buddhist temple or a, an Islamic mosque. His temple is His throne called heaven. But it's interesting. God doesn't dwell in those temples, but He's willing, the Creator of this universe is willing to dwell in our hearts. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, the Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As Brother Matthew very uh, eloquently presented earlier, the invisible things of this earth, how the earth is the altar that should point us to the Creator. Today it goes on to say, look, in verse number 25, neither is worship with men's hands. You, you can't worship Him like he was, they would worship the gods that they were worshiping as though He needed anything, seeing He giveth to, to all life and breath and all things. I like verse 26 because He is the one that created all nations and all kindreds, all nationalities and all people groups. It says, and He hath made of one blood. We're all related, my dear friends. Amen. You trace it back far enough, we go to Noah. You go back a little further, we go to Adam and Eve. He created all. Verse 27, 
It talks about they that seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Take a note of here. The context he's preaching to. He's not opening up the Scriptures and exegeting or expositing a passage of Scripture. He goes to one of their poets and he quotes their poet to share the message of God being the Creator. Look at verse 29. It says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, stone, gra or graven image by art or man's device. So listen, there's no amount of gold that can compare to God. There's no amount of silver. There's no stone that we can find that we could lift up as, as a deity that could compare to God. And there's nothing that we could carve with our hands and make a statue that compares to Almighty God. Babble about Christ the Creator. But now I want to share with you as I read verses 30 and 31, babble about Christ the Vindicator. Yes, He spoke the world into existence, but He's also the one that we will all stand before. And He tells these people at Athens, hey, you, you don't know this, but the unknown God that you are ignorantly worshiping is the one that created us all and that you're going to have to bow down and believe Him and confess that He is Lord. It says, And the times of this ignorance God weeped at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God takes sin seriously. He doesn't throw it out to the side. He cannot allow sin into heaven. And the Bible says that here in our text, He is calling all men to repent. Verse 21, excuse me, 31 says, Because He hath anointed a day, check it out now, here it is, in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men, and that He hath raised Him from the dead. Jesus rose from the grave, and He's talking about Jesus to these Athenians. Amen. If you died right now, are you ready to stand before the righteous judge? If you died right now, are you ready to stand before the Creator of the universe? But if you died right now, will you be ready to meet the Savior who died for you on Calvary's cross? Look at verse 32, 33, and 34. I know we didn't read it earlier, but it all ties together. I wrote thirdly down, babble about Christ the Savior. You see, Paul started with the creation. Then he went to the courtroom of heaven and now he moves to the cross of Calvary. Look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them Howbeit, I like this verse. I love verse 34 because no matter how many people might think we're just a bunch of babblers just babbling on about this Jesus stuff and we're fanatics and, and we're religious and this, that, and the third, here we find that a lot of people may mock, but there's going to be some that believe. Look, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. Among the which was uh, the man named D and the man named A. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, D the A. Don't want to mess up the pronunciation, but it says, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So we find a couple of people mentioned by name who believe and then many other people. Today I just close with this thought. There's times where we need to open up the Old Testament and the New Testament and firmly share God's Word Amen. with somebody who's familiarized with the text. Most people in America are. But there's times where there, we go on a mission field like the Apostle Paul is. We might go to an area in the United States or an area in the world where they don't understand the Word of God. So we have to start with the known and move to the unknown. And that's what the Apostle Paul does here. Babblers for Jesus. Will you babble on for the Lord Jesus Christ? Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for the Apostle Paul's example here 
in this passage. And God, we pray that you would help us to be missionaries here in Roanoke, Virginia, to share the good news of Christ the Creator, Christ the Vindicator, and Christ the Savior. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the title of my message, uh, it comes from Acts chapter 17. I know you're surprised at that. The title of my message is, The Bridge is Out. The Bridge is Out. Two preachers were on the side of the road holding a sign with the words, The end is near. Turn back now. A passing by driver yelled, Leave us alone, you religious nut. And a few minutes later, the two preachers heard a skirt and a big splash. And one preacher turned to the other and said, I knew we should have just said bridge out. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Well, sometimes as preachers, we get a little too complicated with our messages. And the Bible says the Word of God is plain to them that have understanding. I want to keep this real plain for the last few minutes tonight and preach on the bridge is out. The bridge is out when it comes to the church and prayer time. The bridge is out when it comes to the church and Bible reading. The bridge is out when it comes to hearing and listening to God. The bridge is out amongst believers when it comes to the family altar. Hey, I know that nothing shall separate us from the love of God if you're a believer and you know Jesus. I know that God hears the righteous and is far from the wicked if you know Him as your personal Savior. I know that we can go boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need. I know that God looks upon the contrite spirit and those that tremble at His word. But I believe that too many of the household of the faith have created an altar to the unknown God. I understand this passage is written to unbelievers, to the Epicureans, atheists, and Stoics who didn't believe in God. But I want to apply it to the church. You say, what do you mean, unknown God? I know God is the Creator. I know God is a Trinity. I know God is the Father, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. I know God is the, the, the Holy Spirit is the comforter and the Spirit of God leads us into all truth. I know that God, God the Son, was born of a virgin, died according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day. And now He sits at the right hand of the Father and makes intercession for us. So what do you mean, unknown God? I'm saying that many of us who know God and have a knowledge here, we might be saved, but we don't spend time with Him to develop a daily personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to preach to you some symptoms of those who preach or the symptoms of those who worship an unknown God. The first symptom of worshiping an unknown God. Christians that worship an unknown God. Number one, they are idolaters. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. It says this. Now, while Paul w waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. The whole city was worshiping idols. Now, we are so close and so inundated with the world today that it's almost impossible to see or separate ourselves from the idolatry that goes on in the world. And we certainly don't notice the idolatry in the church most of the time. But if we could, like one of my favorite movies, Time Changer, if we lived 100 years ago or even 50 or 60 years ago, and that's all we knew, and we were able to fast forward to today, and we walked into some churches, especially modern churches, we would probably have our heart spirit stirred and look around and say, this, the church today is wholly given to idolatry. I'm not talking about little statues of Buddha or Baal or the sun god. I'm talking about putting things above God. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. And here's a few things the church puts above God. Experiences. Mm. Well, I experienced something, so what you're saying from the Bible may not be true because I experienced something different. Or how about this? Feelings. The church puts feelings above God and His Word and say, well, I don't feel saved, so I must not be saved. Or I don't feel that that's right. We get a little Bible study and we all get together and we say, how do you feel about that passage, brethren and sister? Who cares what you feel about the passage? I want to know what the po passage says, how it applies to me, and understand it. And how about this one? The church 
idolizes possessions. Jesus said, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with the things that you have. For I have promised to never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jesus said, quit worrying about the stuff and worry about me. But the church today is more concerned about possessions than they are about the God who gave them the possessions. So first they were idolaters and the church today has become idolaters. But notice Paul, his heart is stirred in him when he sees given to idolatry. So the bridge is out because many believers don't have a daily walk with God. The bridge is out because too many believers don't have a daily Bible feeding time. The bridge is out because too many believers don't have a family altar. The bridge is out because Christians don't spend time with their Lord. They say they love. Well, number two, not only were they idolatrous, but they were stoop, superstitious. Look at this verse right here. It says, um, uh, it says in verse 22, it says, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Superstitious means you're willing to accept or believe anything without evidence or without reason. Like, for example, you might have bad luck if you're not bringing a rabbit's foot along with you. <laughs> There's no evidence for that. There's no reason for that. It makes no sense. That's superstition. But you know why you bring that rabbit's foot with you? Just in case they might be right. How about this? A ladder, walking under a ladder, or throwing salt over your shoulder, just in case... Something could go wrong if I don't throw that salt over my shoulder. Avoid black cats just in case it could be right. Make sure that you don't break a mirror just in case I get seven years bad luck. Don't open up the umbrella inside just in case I have bad luck. Let me tell you that God is not a God of just in case. Paul, on the other hand, did the opposite. He reasoned out of the Scripture. Look at verse 2, 17, verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them for three Sabbath days, reasoning with them out of the Scriptures. You see, those who know God, know His Word, and know that it is supreme, and therefore reasoning out of the Scriptures is the only way to talk to people about Jesus Christ. And God is not a just-in-case God. You can't wear a cross around your neck and expected to bring you good luck. Amen. You can't take the Bible and just bring it with you to school, young people, and say, oh, hey, I'm a Christian. Things are going to be good for me because I got my Bible. And it don't matter if it's King James or not. It won't make any difference. You can't go around and say, I'm a church goer. I'm in church, so my life's going to be good. You got to open this book up. You got to understand what this book says. Just carrying around. God is not. This is not a lucky charm. And you can't just carry it around and think things are going to be better. And God is not a God of just in case. With God, it's all or nothing. All or nothing. And that's the way these guys were. Legend has it that many years before this event, there was a great famine. And what they decided to do was, like I said, this is legend. They decided to set these lambs free and send them in the direction of all these altars or all these temples that are out. And they would sacrifice a lamb to all the altars. Well, one of the lambs apparently fell in the ground with no temple around it. And so they determined and decided to create this temple and this altar to the unknown God. So here's what they did. They took all of their um, gods and they created one to the unknown God just in case. But God is not a God of just in cases. You're either in or you're out with God. Here's what he said. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I command you? Jesus said, Come and follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Jesus said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He's not a just-in-case God. He's an all-or-nothing God. So number one, I said that they were idolaters. Number two, I said they were, they were superstitious. Number three, I say that they are never satisfied. Look what it says here. Uh, in this verse, verse 21, it said, But either to tell or to hear some new thing. These Epicureans, these Stoics, spent all their time to hear some new thing. They wanted to hear about a new philosophy, a new idea, because they weren't satisfied with what they had. 
They weren't happy to hear some strange God. They wanted to hear this babbler to see if things worked out for them. But of course, as Brian said, look what happened. The results were some mocked, and others said, well, hear thee again of this matter. Yeah. Yes, there were a few saved in verse 34, but for the most part, no results. Right. No results. And when you don't spend time with God, if you don't know who He is, you don't have a personal relationship beyond salvation, then you're never going to be satisfied. You're always going to be looking for some new thing. And Proverbs says, meddle not with them that are given to change. That's something, that's something new. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. Amen. Romans 1 said, change the truth of God into a lie and worship the creature more than the creator. That's some old stuff. Old stuff. Those that worship an unknown God spend their time and to hear and to tell some new thing. The modern church says we need a new, more relevant Bible translation. Uh -huh. They say we need a new King James Version. We need a new International Version. We need a re revised Standard Version. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The church says, oh, we need a new worship experience. Uh -huh. We need to water down some of these songs that sing about the blood of Jesus Christ, that sing about heaven and the glory of God. we got to water those down because people won't come into our uh -huh. church. So we got to have a new way to build a church. We can't go soul winning door to door. we got to get some stadium seating. we got to get us some drink holders in there. Hey, we got to give our offering through automatic deduction. Right? We got to have a new way to have church. I thank God we go to a church with old time religion. I thank God we go to a church where Pastor Brian preaches old fashioned King James Bible. I'm glad we go to a church where the music still sings about the blood and the music still sings about heaven and the music we still sing about the glory of God. I'm glad we go to an old fashioned Bible believing church. All right, I will then. The next thing is this. So I said real quick, number one, they were idolaters. Number two, they were superstitious. Number three, they're never satisfied. Number four, they disobey God. They disobey God. Well, in Exodus chapter 3, Pastor Brian's been preaching out of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3. Here's what Pharaoh said. Pharaoh said, why should I obey God? I'm going to paraphrase it. Oh, I should obey God because I do not know God Jehovah. Mm. That's what Pharaoh said. When Moses came to him and said, let my people go, Pharaoh said, why should I listen to what he says? I don't know him. And let me tell you a real quick story. Whew, real quick story. At, at Fleming High School, the students sometimes don't behave correct or proper. And they might be walking down the hall and you'll say, young man, take your hat off. And they'll give you a few words. Say, uh-uh, F you and your mama and everything else. I ain't taking your hat off. <laughs> but I tell you what, when you are a teacher of these students, then you see them out in the hall and you say, you need to take your hat off. And they'll take, they'll take their hat off. Why? Because they know who you are and they've gained respect for you because they understand that you're not going to back down. Yeah. You see, when you don't know God, why would you obey God and do the things that God has for you? You are not going to do those things if the God is an unknown God to you. So how do we get to know God? We spend time in His Word. We spend time listening to Him and speaking to Him. And we spend time... Praying to Him, reading His Word, and having a personal relationship with Him. That's how we get to know God. Let's pray.